Hello class, whoa. Hello class, welcome to fourth week. Um, I would like to ask if you are in the last five rows to please move forward, make it nice and cozy in here. We can have some discussion later, we want a good, good feeling. Our topic today is going to be transportation. We have uh, two lovely guests we'll introduce in a moment. But uh, I just wanted to ask you guys, how many of you went to the sustainability fair or knew that there's a sustainability fair today? Awesome. Um, yeah, so uh, this was the second annual sustainability fair uh, at UCLA. There were a lot of um, cool speakers and a lot of cool companies and just a lot going on. We actually got a lot of goodies given to us uh, that were left over that uh, we are going to give to you guys. So these are sustainable pens and pencils. Close the loop. These bags are really, really cool. These are Chico bags. And uh, if you guys haven't seen them, like it just looks like a bag and then. Oh, yeah. OK, so we're going to ask you some questions to see who gets them. And then they open up. It's really wrinkly, but. Yeah. They're cool because you can like fit them in your purse, in your pocket, in your, yeah, you know, your backpack. Um, are you really asking questions? I don't know. What's the number between four and six? <laughs> I think it was a tie. <laughs> All right. Awesome. OK, so, uh, so we're going to. Just throw them. Yeah. Questions. The water. Um, I, I got a, I got a, I got a question for the audience. Yeah, settle down a little bit. For the bit. ruler. For, for, um, who here, who here can identify the, um, uh, the first sustainable policy, UC-wide sustainable policy to, uh, have the UCs use renewable energy? The name of the policy. Anybody? Nobody? Can you try? Give it a shot. Okay, the cool. Presidential climate commitment. Um, that's not, ex I don't think that's exactly a policy that is close. But um, I wanted to tell you guys about this because we just had our talk on energy and it was very fulfilling and long and we didn't get a chance, I didn't get a chance to uh, tell you guys about, about this uh, policy that was implemented in about 2005. It was kind of a landmark policy that was brought on mainly by students. Um, some of the same students that helped start this class and perhaps even got interested in sustainability because of this class. It was called the uh, Clean Energy and Building. Uh, it's clean, yeah, cl green building and clean energy policy. Um, and mandate that UC-wide uses 18% renewable energy. So we're now doing that because of efforts from folks like you. So I wanted just to pass that on before we move into other areas, other topics. And Lucina wins no, the I don't win the bag. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I don't need a bag. Um, I, I just wanted to, to let you guys know like how much, you know, how much effect that we've had um, as students in terms of, it makes us the, the UC, the eighth largest institutional purchaser of renewable energy. So that's pretty huge. Um, Who knows how many tons of CO2 are emitted from one gallon of gas? Five? Yeah, I think it's 20. Awesome. Good job. Four. Okay, so um, speaking of, are you ready? Yeah, okay, so um, before, and so staying on the topic of energy before we move on, we have a exciting presentation. Um, no, we're not. Okay, go. We're gonna do field trips, we'll do that after. Oh, okay, so let's have a quick uh, announcement um, that, regards, uh, that regards renewable and clean energy that affects all of us, so. You ready? Yeah, and this isn't okay. about renewable and clean energy. It's about power vote. Oh, um, never mind. <laughs> you to vote a certain way 
or anything like that. But I think a lot of us were really, all really busy, and it's hard to educate ourselves on what a lot of these props are and what like you know what what things are going on. So I think PowerVote is just a great way to have that resource. Um, on a separate note, uh, we talked uh, the last couple times about having a field trip of some sort, uh, an official one. So uh, we've decided on two different options. You guys can go on both. You can go on one of them. You don't have to go on any of them. Uh, just an opportunity. On November 2nd, we will be going to the Santa Monica Farmer's Market. You know, we'll go, go down there, take the blue bus. It only costs a quarter. Um, you can check it out, check out the shops, and then, you know, maybe go to the beach afterwards or something. Uh, November 22nd, we will be planting trees uh, with tree people. And, uh, you know, so if you want to get dirty but make a difference, you get to plant a tree, you get to name your trees. That's always fun. Um, I've named my trees Kermit and a couple other trees. But anyways, uh, I really hope you guys uh, sign up, and I really hope you, we see you out there. So we'll be doing this. We have another announcement um, from a very awesome, very energized group of students uh, from CalPerg. CalPerg is really, really awesome. I support these guys. So um, uh, they have something to talk about, which is highly relevant to transportation issues today. So um, let's hear from them. And if you guys could use the mic, that'll get them doing that. get them doing Awesome. Wow, you guys are excited. I'm excited too. Um, so like Latina said, I'm from CalPerg. Um, CalPerg is a student group on campus. And one of our big campaigns, the one I'm here to talk to you guys about, um, is our high speed rail campaign. Has anyone heard of high speed rail here? Yeah, yeah. OK, you guys, awesome. Uh, so a lot of people haven't heard about it. I'll just go over really briefly why it's really cool. Um, it's one of those propositions that Michael was talking about. It's Proposition 1A on the ballot um, that we'll be voting on November 4th. And we all know, um, we all know there's too many cars, too much pollution, too much traffic in California. Um, and what Proposition 1A does is it starts the construction of a rail line that connects California, San Francisco to LA in two and a half hours. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, it goes all the way down to, to San Diego, it stops in the Central Valley, goes all the way up to Sacramento. It's awesome. It also costs about half as much as the alternatives, which are more roads, more airport expansions, more fuel, dirty oil, that kind of stuff, bad stuff. Um, this is way cleaner. Um, it's run on electricity, um, which is pretty awesome. And it goes about 225 miles an hour, which is just cool. Uh, what we're doing is, a lot of you guys heard about it, but only about 22% of California voters have heard about it. And we're two weeks away from the election. So what we need to do is just create a buzz, let everybody that we know uh, know that they should vote yes on Prop 1A. Um, what we're doing is that Sarah's going to pass around um, a pledge. It says that you'll vote yes on Prop 1A, which is pretty obvious, um, and that you'll tell your friends about it. We're having a huge day of action on Tuesday, the 28th. We're going to be having a Facebook flash mob table where we're getting everybody to join the Facebook group. Um, we're having calling out to people you already know but who might not know about Prop 1A, uh, texting out the vote, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, and we're aiming to talk to, tw or not talk to, but contact 24,000 people statewide um, just from UCLA. And this is happening on all the UC campuses. So you can imagine hundreds of thousands of people are going to be contacted. Um, so you guys should all become a part of this. Um, and you can do that by filling out your name on the pledge that Sarah is passing out and putting down your number and checking that you're interested in volunteering. And we'll give you a call about how you can get involved. Um, so that's all I have to say. You guys are awesome. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Corinne. That was awesome. What? Yeah. Um, also, Tracy had something else she wanted to say. Uh, so <laughs> we'll, we'll let her back up here. I'm back. Hello. Um, actually, if also, I need to collect those pledge cards from you before I leave. So if you can maybe pass them to the aisles, that would be great. And I'll come by and collect them. But this evening, there is a really cool talk that E3, Ecology, Economy, and Equity, is putting on. It's from 6 to 8 in the Kirchhoff Art Gallery. 
And this talk is called Environmental Justice is Social Justice, Understanding Our Movement. So basically, historically, there has been a big divide between environmental and social justice movements. You don't typically hear environmental groups talking about racial justice or, or economic justice. And you also don't really hear social justice groups talking about the need for renewable energy or um, compostable silverware. But these things are really connected. And these two movements need to start working together if we are going to achieve the world that we want. And we're all people who care about the environment. It's obvious we're all here. Um, but we can't ignore these social issues and these social systemic problems that are creating um, the climate crisis, as well as um, these, these problems that are byproducts of the, the crisis. So, um, I really urge everyone to come. It's going to be a great talk. We have a speaker named Dave Shukla, who is an environmental and social justice activist. He's on the National Council for Student Environmental Action Coalition, and he's on the steering committee for REC, the Res Responsible Endowments Coalition, and he is also a labor organizer in the Port of Los Angeles. So he's going to be first from 6 to 7 doing a talk on the movements, and then from 7 to 8, it's going to be an interactive workshop on how to um, collaborate and have these movements working together. So I have flyers that I will hand out. Um, I hope to see all of you there. Um, so interestingly enough, we're gonna be talking about transportation today, uh, as you guys know. And um, we have two amazing speakers. However, um, one of them is getting here by public transit. And as it turns out, Wilshire Boulevard is a mess. So it's a little bit late. So this might be uh, <laughs> clear evidence that we need to be using more public transportation and alternative transportation. I mean, kind of ironic, right? Um, so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, or we need to improve our public transportation, as Dorothy aptly points out. Um, so, <laughs> so without further ado, um, uh, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Her name is Dorothy Lay, and she is the Planning and Policy Director for the Los Angeles County Bicycle Coalition. So that's a bicycle advocacy coalition of Los Angeles. She's also a recent graduate of UCLA. So fellow Bruin, woo. Um, and she's gonna talk to us today about a number of issues. Um, are you ready? All right. Uh, okay. Did you, am I, can you hear me without it? Go on oh, Brunecast, sorry. Right Must there. do Brunecast. <laughs> okay. Hello. Can you hear? Is this better? Is this okay? Yeah. Wow, technology's changed so much since I graduated. We've got like all this Brunecasting. You don't even have to go to class anymore to get the full experience. That's pretty amazing. Um, hey, everyone. I'm Dorothy, and I graduated UCLA in 2007 so a little bit over a year ago, with environmental science. Who here is an environmental science major? Anyone? Sweet. Studies? OK, yeah, I, that was my minor, environmental studies. Good. Um, cool. I was actually the first graduate of environmental science. I, I was a um, chemistry major at first, and then I did geography, and then, all, and then the major came out. And I guess the two uh, different majors went together, and they formed one major, environmental science. So it was really cool. How many, um, here, uh, how many of you here are first years? Cool. Second years? Awesome. Third years? Wow, there's a lot of third years. Fourth years? Cool. And then fifth years. I was a fifth year. I, I graduated in five years. That's so good. Um, cool. So it's a really um, broad group of people. Um, you change a lot during all, um, all of the years you're here at, at UCLA and college, and it's really amazing. And what I want to talk about today is um, the work I do with LA County Bicycle Coalition. I think um, how they wanted it to set, up, set it up um, was that Tim was going to give the overarching view of transportation, and I was supposed to go into like what um, 
more small scale. But since um, he's not here, I'm going to um, just think of that in mind, because he's going to give more of a, of a bigger picture, you know, greenhouse gases and how transportation affects that. And for me, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the bicycle and, and personal mobility that you can, you, like everything that you can do to make a difference just by biking or walking to work or school. So um, you, you're not going to get the big picture from me, but you'll get it from Tim in a little bit. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my work at LACBC, and I'm going to connect it to the work that you all do here on campus, which is really important. And then I'm going to connect it to Los Angeles as a region, because um, there are some unique challenges and issues that Los Angeles faces. And we all here have an important role in, that, in, in those issues. So anyways, um, what I do for LACBC, I'm the Planning and Policy Director. The, one of the main jobs I do is I work to increase access to um, increased bicycle and pedestrian access to six different transit hubs. This is a specific project that I was hired on for um, because as many of you may know, how many of you have interned or worked for a nonprofit? Yeah? Cool. So they're always struggling for money. And so how I was hired on was that they said I had a specific project to do. And it's through a grant. And um, basically, I create a plan that uh, tries to increase biking, walking to six, six transit stations. Four of them are in South LA. It's an environmental justice grant. And one of them is in Van Nuys, and one of them is in Santa Clarita. And they're concentrated in low-income areas. So um, how many of you heard? You probably have all heard of environmental justice. and. Yeah, OK, cool. So just um, that low-income people and people of color are more, um, more affected by environmental problems. But um, Tracy's talk will deal more with that. So I, I'll touch that a little bit. Um, that was how I was hired on, and I, I work on that actively. But also, because we're an advocacy group, I work directly uh, this is the more exciting part of my job, is I work with the city councils and with Metro and with a lot of different bureaucracies to push them to create change in terms of bicycling in Los Angeles. Um, more bike facilities, more bike lanes, uh, more bike parking, access on the trains. Actually, we just had an important victory recently. Metro is actually removing about 2,000 seats in their trains to give room to cyclists, um, which is really exciting because there's been a lot of conflict between cyclists and, and, um, and transit users. And although there's a trade-off, you're going to have less um, people there's a less capacity for people without bikes. It's really important because especially with people who are newer to cycling, to be able to access the transit system is really important because a lot of times when you're cycling along Los Angeles because it's such a big area, you're really intimidated to be able to go from one end of the, the city to the next. So that's really exciting and important. How many of you actually cycle um, or know how to or ride around Los Angeles? Um, how many of you are really scared to ride around Los Angeles? Yeah. That's, that's, I think that's the number one thing that people talk about when they talk about cycling in Los Angeles is that it's really, really um, scary and they're scared to, to, um, to do it. So uh, what we try to do is we're trying to make the streets safer so that everyone can feel comfortable cycling in Los Angeles. And some of the exciting campaigns that we're working on are this thing, uh, this campaign, it's called the Sharrows campaign. It's, has, uh, has anyone you heard of a Sharrow or shared lane marking? No? It's, uh, it's actually in, at UCLA campus. It's one of the few places that actually have Sharrows. Um, it's those, it's a little symbol of a bicycle with the two arrows. Um, they're on the roads at UCLA. And what they actually do is they, Usually, they're actually, they're actually not constructed correctly at UCLA. They didn't do a good job with it, but at least they're there. They're actually meant to be next to a parked car. And what they do is they uh, let driver or they let cyclists know to get outside of the door zone. Because as many of you who cycle know, if you're riding next to a parked car, it's really, uh, it's really um, terrifying because not only can you not only are you thinking about, oh, the, the driver's on my left side trying to pass me, but also on the right side, if there's a parked car, there's a car door opening. And if you're going, you're, you're too close to the car, that car door could really hurt you and could really cause serious injury. So that Shero tells cyclists where to place themselves, because it's placed outside of the, the so-called door zone. Also, it tells uh, um, drivers that cyclists belong on the road. And as you know, in Los Angeles, it's really important that especially important in Los Angeles, that motorists know that cyclists belong on the road. And a lot of motorists, even cops, don't even know that cyclists belong on the road. Um, I don't know how many times I've had those pseudo cops, those parking people, beep at me and say, get off the road. And it's ridiculous because they're 
members of the law enforcement and they don't even know the, the law, so it's really sad. So that's an exciting campaign and the reason I brought this up is because it's taken about three years for this campaign to really make a difference and right now we're at a really critical point in which we're actually some of the council districts in Los Angeles are actually going to be placing sheriffs on the road. And the reason I bring this up is because in Los Angeles, it takes a really long time to do things. Um, it's, it's ridiculous how long it takes, and it's, it's, it's really frustrating, but it's really important that we do work in Los Angeles. Um, another campaign that we're working on is that we're working to get obtain bicycle counts in Los Angeles. How many of you are from more bicycle-friendly areas like San Francisco or Portland or maybe even Seattle? Even, maybe even some suburbs are really bike-friendly. Well, a lot of those, those cities, how they became bike-friendly is that they initially counted how many cyclists were in their area. So what it takes is you're just standing on a couple street corners and you count the cyclists that pass through an intersection and you are, use a formula to extra, extrapolate that data so that you know how many cyclists exist in the area. Because just like with energy and greenhouse gas emissions, if you can't get a baseline, you won't be able to improve. And Los Angeles is way behind on that, and they have not started bicycle counts. So what Los Angeles County Bicycle Coalition is doing is starting that initial push to get obtain bicycle counts in LA. And it's, it's a really exciting campaign that we're starting. And, um, hopefully you'll find out more about it um, in the coming uh, months and years. The third thing that we're working on is um, there's a bicycle master plan that's being updated in Los Angeles. And this is actually where um, some of you who are interested in these issues may be able to play a really critical role because it's a bicycle master plan and uh, just to backtrack a little bit, a bicycle master plan is a plan that sets policy goals and implementation implementation strategies for improving um, the bicycle conditions in Los Angeles. And what they're working on is an update and they're really setting some aggressive policy goals and some really interesting ideas like, like bicycle boulevards. Um, they're, they're a street that uh, Anyone you, you from Berkeley? They have them at Berkeley. They're, they're, they're bicycle priority street, which is a really neat idea because most streets are car priority, just de facto. But what, what this does is a bicycle boulevard creates a, an environment where cyclists are, are, are preferred. So in, instead of stop signs, they have tr there's traffic circles so that with, with, if you cycle, you know that every time you stop, you lose a lot of momentum and you have to restart again. And so in a, in a bicycle boulevard street, there's traffic circles or and there's also diverters so that cars are diverted off that road so that cyclists can go through. And actually, in the LA Bicycle Master Plan, they're planning some bicycle boulevards, which is really exciting, and they're planning some new bike lanes and things. And actually, in this area, UCLA, there's a dearth of, of bicycle facilities. There's not enough. As, and the one thing that people say getting access to UCLA from, from work or, or, um, or if they work here or if they're students here and they live a little bit further away is they say the one thing that gets them not to, to bicycle to UCLA is that there's no bicycle facilities accessing UCLA. So when, when um, this bicycle master plan, when the input comes in for this, I really encourage you as students to really take an active role. And this is happening in December was where they're going to get the public comment for the, the first draft of the bicycle master plan. And if, if we can get the public to really push this thing, it can really have a lot of legs. Because the last bicycle master plan, which was passed in 1996, over 75% of it has not been implemented. And it's a really sad thing. And they're just, one of the biggest reasons is, hi, Tim. One of the biggest reasons is because there wasn't a movement. Think about it. About 12 years ago, how many cyclists were there in Los Angeles? Very little. Um, and there wasn't a, a, a solid group of organized people. Now, it's, it's a lot more popular. It, it could be, obviously, we need a lot more cyclists out there. We need the roads to be safer. But right now, there's all this energy because of the consciousness, the energy crisis, gas prices. There's a lot more people on the road. Actually, uh, there's estimates that uh, there's about 25% more cyclists in LA County uh, since one year ago, which is pretty amazing. And we haven't done jack for bicycles. So just the fact that it's, it's you know, the gas prices things forces people to do it, it really shows you that there's really a need for it. <clears throat> I'm just going to bring this back around. So those are the campaigns we're working on. And I'm just going to bring this back around to my involvement at UCLA. So when I was at UCLA, I uh, 
I didn't really know what I was going to do. Uh, I had a lot of pressures from my parents and from s society or whatever. I know I'm being all emo right now. But um, I was actually pre-med when I was at UCLA. Uh, my, my parents were just very, they're very traditional Asian parents and they just really wanted me to be a doctor. And I, I listened to them because I, there wasn't anything else about me that was really typically Asian. So I was like, well, maybe um, if I become a doctor, then I can be more I can please them and, and be a, a, a good child or whatever. So I was, I was, I was you know, chemistry major for three years and, and I was doing activism on the side, kind of denying that I, I really enjoyed environmental issues, kind of denying that that was something maybe I should pursue as a career because I thought that's not practical. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make my parents happy. What kind of work is there for, for an environmental person? I, I don't want to graduate college and not have a job. Um, so there's all these things going on. And, and finally, um, I, w I got really involved in school. I was involved in E3. I was the co-chair of it at the end of my career at UCLA. I was involved in a bunch of other organizations like identity-based organizations and social justice organizations. The long story short of it is I finally figured myself out. And when I graduated, I, I finally told my parents I didn't want to become a doctor. And it's crazy because all the all the all the things that I learned at UCLA um, through being involved in environmental work and through being involved in, in bicycle advocacy and getting more cyclists on the road actually at UCLA for some reason I just happen to have the qualifications for the job that I have currently just through the work that I was doing at UCLA not even through trying to get a job but just through my passions and what I just really want to emphasize is that if you if you all follow your passions then it's, and, and, are, and are consistent with it and not flaky and actually have follow through on it, you can really make a career about, uh, with what you love and, and you can really actually figure yourself out because I didn't actually realize I loved working on bicycles until I got the job and figured things out. And, and, and actually working in this organization, I'm 24 and I'm probably the youngest one in pretty much all, my, all the spaces that I'm in. And I'm, I actually think I possess more skills than people who have been involved in bikes and, and, and other um, forms of activism sort of um, outside of school because of the skills I learned at school. It's amazing how many meetings I've gone to and said, dude, friggin' Lucino could uh, facilitate this better than this you know, old guy, whatever. <laughs> you know, ISIS could do a better job you know, organizing this conference or whatever. It's amazing how much, how much you do learn being uh, involved in, 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 in organizations. How many of you here are actively involved on your campus? How many of you here <laughs> maybe aren't but want to? Yeah? I just want to encourage you there. I know it's hard because because, to believe you me, when I first started UCLA Brunewalk, I would run away. And whenever people would give me papers, I would, I would didn't even give them eye contact and I would just throw it in the trash. So I understand the, the um, it's intimidating and I understand that you have a lot of things going on in your life, but I just really want to encourage you to get involved because not only do you make a difference, but you also learn a lot about yourself. You, you become more mature, and, and even though it's really challenging, and there are definitely times where I really wanted to quit, and there are definitely times where I thought it was unhealthy to be involved, because you know, once you get involved, they suck you dry, and you, know, you, you kind of feel really, really lifeless or whatever. Um, and you're at home really late, and your roommates are probably like, you're never home, you know, things like that. But, Long story short, it's, it's actually, it really helps you in life later. When you get out of college, it really does help you, and you're much more prepared to do the things you do, even if you aren't involved in activism. Let's say you become a lawyer, or a doctor, or a teacher. Every space you have, you have to organize people, and you have to create presentations, and you have to present yourself in a, in a professional way. And being involved really helps you do that. So whatever you end up doing, I think just being involved in Conscious um, at UCLA really, you have to take advantage of the things that this offers. And to wrap it um, around, bringing it back to Los Angeles in general, I just want you all to remember that being in Los Angeles is really unique. Um, it's probably the most, one of the most diverse places in the world. Um, it's got a lot of problems. All of its institutions are really messed up from the top to the bottom. 
being at UCLA is a total example of that. The UC Regents, your professors, the whole you know, industrial, military, academic complex. It's crazy. And you're, you're involved in the middle of it. And you know, just take that and really take advantage of, of all that and really try to make a difference because you, LA is really unique. It's different than New York. It's different than San Francisco. It's different than any other city. And a lot of times what happens is people who learn a lot of things in LA leave LA and they're like, well, this is too much. I have to be somewhere else because I'm like freaked out and this is too much. Of course, you have to do what is healthy for you and what's right for yourself because you don't want to go crazy living in some place like Los Angeles. But also keep in mind that a lot of people leave Los Angeles. It's called sort of like ecological brain drain. Is a lot of people learn a lot of things from Los Angeles. They learn about environmental issues. They learn about social justice. And they leave and they make a difference in other places. But really what's needed is, is work here at home. Um, and if, if the bright minds at UCLA and, and other in institutions don't stay in Los Angeles, then we're just going to perpetuate the same system that we're trying to fight. So that's, I just want to close off with that. And Tim's got a really excellent presentation. And I'm sure there, I think there's some questions or something maybe. I'm not sure, but that's it. OK, do you have any questions? I know, it's random. random, right? OK, yeah. What's your name? Julie. Julie, cool. Um, OK, so this is what happened. So I was really lazy, first of all. I didn't want to walk everywhere. And so I saw people biking, and I thought, wow, they get to campus in five minutes versus 20 minutes schlepping over the hill. So I thought, OK, that's one thing. And then another thing is I really was sick of being in Westwood all the time. And taking the bus sometimes is good, but I thought it was really slow. So a lot of people told me that if I started biking, I would actually get out into Santa Monica and things a lot faster, and I would get exercise. So I thought, I'll try it. But I was really scared. So I went, actually went on a critical mass. Have any of you heard of critical mass? Or Yeah. So I was really intimidated by the critical mass idea, but I thought, OK, I'll try it out. And I remember the first time I crossed Wilshire Boulevard on a bike. It was one of the scariest moments of my life. I thought I was going to get hit by a car. But I was with a group of people. It was just really scary. But I just got involved because I, I just recognized that bicycling can be a really, a really excellent form of transportation. And, and even though it's really scary, uh, there's a lot. And it's not for everyone or everything. Obviously, if you're going 40 miles or more, it, it might be harder to get from point A to point B on a bicycle. But it's really excellent for a lot of things, like doing errands, um, going to Santa Monica, going to a bar, because you can drink a little bit and not you know, <laughs> injure someone too terribly. So those are the reasons why I, I started bicycling. And, and I recognize that at UCLA, there were a lot of issues with bicycling. There aren't enough bike lanes going to UCLA. And there, aren't, there wasn't enough bike parking and stuff. So I, I, I wanted to work on those issues and push UCLA to, to make some changes. Any other questions? What's your name? Yogi. Yogi? Yeah, it's annoying because I always get I'm at the bus stop and there's two, two bikes there. Yeah. Two We're actually pushing Metro. <laughs> Tim works for Metro. We're actually pushing Metro to <laughs> adopt the, the, the three the three bike racks on the buses, because in a lot of cities they have that. But that still doesn't address the big issues that there's just not enough support for bicycling in general. There's not enough bike parking at, at transit stations. There's not enough bike, bike facilities in general. So that's one issue. But definitely, that's really important. Oh, and the reason they don't have it is because you know they're bureaucrats, and they're not creative. And they always could think of constraints. I'll have a different answer. <laughs> <coughs> that's my opinion of why they don't have it. Good. Um, you know what the bike Oh, thank you. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. So this weekend, if you're around, um, there's going to be a bicycle celebration called Bike Town Beta, which is in Westwood. And they're going to be, I think, closing off some streets, right? And celebrating cyclists. And it's actually really grassroots, super DIY, underground thing. But it's happening in Westwood, which is really cool. So you totally should get out and do it yourself. Yeah, and you're not up to the lingo. Tim obviously is. Lucino, get on it. I know. Sorry, another acronym. Um, 
So anyways, it's, uh, it's on this weekend, so you should totally check it out and see what's going on. Yeah, I think it's around the streets of uh, uh, Gailey and like goes around like, like Lacan. Mm -hmm. Kind of does a loop around Westwood from what I saw. If you go on to, um, oh, okay, some resources, sorry. If you go on to bikeboom.com, that gives you all the sort of bicycle events that happen around across the city, B-I-K-E-B-O-O-M.com. And then there's also a site called Midnight Riders, which is M I. okay, I'll just write down. But those are really good places to start um, to learn about cycling in Los Angeles. So well, um, our, next, our next guest is Tim Poppendrob. He is a regional uh, transportation manager for the Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transit Authority. AKA Metro. What? AKA Metro. Did I say it right? It's the Transportation Authority. We're, not, we're more than transit. Anyway, keep going. Didn't I say Transportation Authority? Transit. Transit. Oh, it's probably because I'm from New York, and we, I don't know. I don't. Um, so, <laughs> but he works on sustainable transportation um, as well as also being a graduate of UCLA and uh, master's in urban planning. Um, so, um, I'll give it over to him. Okay. Um, so, welcome everyone. Um, you know, I came here by bus, which to some of you, it's kind of new, and to others, it's like, what's up with the system? But I will tell you this, I was 15 minutes later than I normally was because congestion's getting worse and worse and worse in LA, and it just makes life very difficult. So while we're getting all the technical stuff figured out, I'm gonna ask you guys a few questions so that I can understand where you guys are from and what you're, what you're all about. It kind of helps me frame what I'm saying. My PowerPoint can be given in many different ways, but it's just, I need to just check where everyone's from. So, First of all, hands up, who was born and raised in Los Angeles? Wow, that's a lot of people. Okay, who was born and raised in California? Okay, so it's still got the California draw. Who was born and raised in a state adjacent to California? Okay, who was, raised, who was born and raised in another state in the US? East Coast? Midwest? City. South, okay, Midwest, South. okay, good. Um, is anybody born or raised outside of the U.S.? Okay. Yes, I have an accent. I'm not acting. This is my accent. Um, <laughs> I'm from Australia, as you can tell. Um, who has um, traveled outside of the U.S.? Wow, you guys must have some wealthy parents. Okay. Um, have you guys traveled outside? So has everybody, anybody traveled to Europe? Okay, so you've seen some European cities. South America? Or just anything south of Tijuana? Because that's actually San Diego, so, okay. Um, has anybody been to Asia? Okay. Africa? Okay. Has anyone been to Antarctica? Trying. Australia? Okay. So you guys are well-traveled. Okay. Um, the, these are gonna be the harder questions. How have people been getting around um, UCLA? Do people mainly ride their bike? Okay. Drive to campus because it's really expensive to get housing that's around this area. Does everyone live in shared accommodation? Does anybody live, yeah, anybody live by themselves in their own house? Okay, so we're not there yet, all right. Um, if anybody um, has taken, oh, it looks like it's working now. Has anybody ridden the MTA bus system? I don't need comments, just if you, yes or no. <laughs> Has anyone ridden the Santa Monica Big Blue bus system? Okay, Culver City bus? Okay, so you guys are pretty familiar with what's going on. Have you, um, how many of you have taken the LAX flyway bus out of the airport or Westwood? Do you know the ones at Westwood? So lot 32 has a flyway bus that goes straight to downtown? Okay. Whenever you're ready. Oh, so we're cool to go? Okay. Uh, where's the PowerPoint from? Right it's from here? Okay. All right, so let me just quickly... Oh, God, it's one of these things. All right, hang on a second, guys. Where the hell is it? Um, well, it's good. It means that a lot of you guys have traveled. You've seen other places. You're familiar with what's going on. Uh, you're trying different modes. Um, 
trust me, when I used to do this, and I used to get like one or two hands that had, had done everything you guys done. So obviously this year group is, is interested in seeing more of what's out there. Um, I'm just trying to get to my word to the wise. When you have a flash drive with 10 gigabytes of memory, you tend to have too many files. You don't know where the hell you are. What's that? Well, I travel, dude, so what can I say? All right, so, oh, and they didn't tell me this was getting filmed, so I'm going to have to edit what I say, which is really annoying. All right. Yeah, it doesn't need to be, no, it doesn't need to be that dark. I think it could just be like, OK. Is it like a remote clicker, or do I have to press it myself? OK, can you just be there so I can nod, and you can just change the slides? Really high tech, you know, really, really high tech. So, I'm going to get my water. I think you just press the down arrow. This is water, by the way, don't worry, it's water. Um, so, what we're going to quickly talk about today is um, the title. Uh, it's, it's a really complex title, but this whole issue of sustainability and climate change is a really important topic, especially when it comes to your generation, uh, my generation, um, basically anybody who's under 45, we're going to experience it in our lifetime, unless you live a really hard life and you don't make it to 60, but we're going to experience a lot of these issues, and the most pressing part of sustainability right now is climate change. How are we going to mitigate it? How are we going to adapt to it? And how are we going to move beyond the current rhetoric that we're hearing uh, in the public sphere of it's too expensive to do these changes, it's too hard, I don't know what to do. Everyone's kind of getting a bit of a panic. We've got this massive global meltdown with the financial crisis. There's this huge subprime mortgage lending crisis, which has meant a lot of people are uh, forced to leave their homes. What it's really done, though, it's kind of made us look back and think, you know, maybe this lifestyle that we have, this Western lifestyle, is no longer sustainable. Maybe we really can't sustain it. And when I mean sustainable, we're not looking at that, you know, the World Council definition of sustainability. We're actually talking about, it's not really the whole thing of, you know, oh my gosh, the, the oceans and the plants and the, and the animals are going to die. We're going to die. You know, when you're talking about sustainability, you're talking about human survival. Can we sustain ourselves as a, as a civilization? And so, you know, you, you hear all these different things in the media, and the media is, you know, the media, they're interested in selling whatever it is they're going to sell. One day they'll tell you the sky's blue, the next day they'll tell you it's red, the next day it's falling, the next day it's sunny, whatever's going to sell. So, you know, whatever they tell you, they tell you. But the bottom line is, our daily actions, our daily choices is what's affecting global climate change. It's not what somebody else is doing in another country, it's not the fact that we've got coal-powered plants, it's not the fact that we've got you know, cars you know, that are made out of steel instead of recycled soybean and oil or something like that. It's the fact that we are making every single day choices and those choices add up cumulatively and that's what causes a lot of these, these issues. And whether you believe it or not, the evidence is there and I think we've, we've kind of gone past that, thankfully. I've been working on this for 10 years now, so it's, we've finally gone that, 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 that point. Um, I'm a little bit older than Dorothy, but not that much. Uh, and, but I mean, basically, Dorothy is pretty much on the same trajectory. And hopefully, when you guys will graduate, you'll stay on that trajectory of looking for information, looking for answers, and trying to get to the source of the issues. And the more you're out there, the more you're doing these things, the easier it becomes to find information, the easier it becomes to, to sift through all this stuff. So let's go on with this whole PowerPoint. This is one of those um, popular education diagrams that we develop. This is basically about 700 pages of research. And what you do is you distill all this information and bring it down to bite-sized pieces that people can kind of understand. You can't expect someone to read through a 700-page document of information and come out and say, oh, yeah, I get it. Totally understand. I know what I have to do. Or ream through like spreadsheets and spreadsheets of stuff because they're not going to get it. What you have to do is you have to create these really simple, clear diagrams that are not simplistic, they're not condescending, they're not, they're not like you know, trying to make it Mickey Mousey. It's trying to show very clear connections of what we're doing. This is one of those diagrams that shows you basically how my, my area of, of climate change, which is focusing on transportation and land use, how that affects, uh, how that basically uh, affects uh, global climate change. And, and when you bring it down, you see where the sources are. So from the top, we have global climate change. We break that down. Okay, what's the key cause of global climate change? 
Is it human activities or is it natural activities? Well, most scientists, 10,000 scientists agree that it's human activities, 200 that are paid by corporations say that it's not. So um, the red bubbles show the main cause. That's the whole point of this, it's a drill down diagram. Within human activities, we blow it, we blow it up further and say, okay, what, what, what is it about human activities? Well, it's urban activities, not rural, contrary to what most people believe. More people live in cities in the world than ever before. Right now, about 55% of the world's population live in cities. By 2050, it'll be about 70%. So the, it's, a, it's an urban issue. And then within the urban construct of energy inputs, there's, there's five key areas of energy inputs in, an, in what makes a city a city. Most of the energy inputs that are the most egregious for climate change are from transportation. There's some from electricity, which is significant, some from industry, some from buildings, and some from waste. But the key cause is transportation. When you drill down transportation again, you look at air transportation, surface transportation, and sea transportation. The biggest culprit of all of those three is surface transportation. And what I mean by surface transportation, I mean basically trucks and autos. That, that's the main cause. Some comes from construction of vehicles, some comes from rail freight, some comes from roads themselves, very little comes from transit, but the majority is from cars and trucks. Now, cars and trucks are not driving themselves around the freeways all day by themselves. People are. So you have to go a little bit further and say, yes, most of the emissions that we're counting are from cars and trucks, but most of those emissions are caused because of other things that are not related to the vehicle itself. So what are those other things? Well, the way cities are designed, the way they design their housing, where they place their jobs, where they place their shopping centers, how they design their shopping centers, whether they make parking available too much or, or that sort of, or make it free. The transportation funding policy, our federal government, our state government funds a lot of these things through your, through your taxes. So there's three sources of funding for transportation. One is when you go to the gas pump, 18.4 cents goes to the federal government, 18 cents comes to the state government, and the total amount that you pay, a little portion of that is a sales tax, and that goes to the state government as well. Also, when you buy every, when, every time you go and buy something in LA County, one cent of that 8.75 percent you're paying goes to the MTA to build transportation infrastructure and operate transportation infrastructure. So your taxes, every time you're going to buy gas, et cetera, that's how we get these funds. So the way that those funds are used, though, in conjunction with the way local, local land uses are decided upon, affects whether or not you have to drive everywhere or whether you can walk, bike, or take transit. So that's how clear the connection is that where you live and where you work or go to school, how you get there and how what's available to you in terms of alternatives goes all the way up the chains, all the way up to global climate change. So that's how clear it is. Your transportation decisions drive climate change, negatively or positively, it depends what you're doing. Obviously walking is better, driving a big fat Escalade is bad. So everything in between is where you guys are and you're trying to constantly regulate it every, every time you get a decision. Next slide. So this is the effects of global climate change. It's not as global out there, out in the stratosphere, oh my God, what's going on? It's local. This is the great fires of 2003. I have another photo of the great fires of the 90s, 2001, 2007, 2008. We have fires right now. So it's, this is one of the, the instant reactions of when the areas are getting too hot. And I don't know about you guys, but it's October 22nd, and it's 90 degrees outside. And the ones that are from Los Angeles, you can, I've been here for 12 years, you can all agree we haven't had it this hot in a very, very long time, especially in October, this late in October. You know, I'm rethinking my Halloween costume now because it's going to be this hot. I'm not going to wear my, my woolen thing. It's not going to, I usually go as a Viking, and I'm not going to go as a Viking. You know, so it's got too much fur, I'm going to take it all off. You know. Um, next slide. And so, so the thing on urban sustainability is, you know, how do we get there? This is the Los Angeles metropolitan area. You know, it is the most paved conurbation in the United States. Um, it's also, believe it or not, the most dense urban conurbation in the United States. The metropolitan area of Los Angeles is more dense than the metropolitan area of greater New York, New York uh, City. That doesn't sound right to most people, but what it is is Manhattan and the boroughs around Manhattan are really dense, 
and then you end up with rural sprawl as far as the, as the sea goes out to the Jersey sea, seaboard and out to um, the Hamptons in, in Long Island, or Long Island, as you say. So it goes all the way out there. Whereas LA is kind of like this heartbeat. It's like a little bit of density, lower density, a little bit of density, lower density, but it goes all the way out to San Bernardino, Palm Springs, all the way out to Ventura, down to San Diego, Tijuana, all the way up north to um, Bakersfield. It's pretty much up and down. It's not, not super sprawled, low density. It's just this consistent, you know, we'll call it medium density sprawl. And so what that does is it kind of creates the, the worst of both worlds. You have high density without the infrastructure for alternatives, and you have a high amount of people that want to get to the same places all the time, which is why we have such horrific congestion on a lot of the freeways. So how do we get there? Just keep clicking down. So everybody's here. There's no sustainable city in the world. I hate to break anybody's bubble, but you know, Copenhagen, Zurich, they're not there. So there's no sustainable city. We're all here. We need to get to Z. How do, how do we get there, right? B through Y is all the actions that we have to take to get there. And there's a whole laundry list of actions. There's like 5,000 of them that we can take. So everybody's at a different phase and everyone's at a different stage of it, but the whole key is that everybody's agreeing all over the world um, and in the United States that we need to get there. We need to make sure that we can get there as quickly as we can. Uh, recently, there was a US conference of mayors, if anybody uh, is familiar with this, where 75% um, of the US population that lives in cities, their mayors have signed on to a climate action agreement already. They've, 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 they've basically agreed to become as uh, work towards developing a climate action plan, uh, reducing the greenhouse gas emissions, and making the, making the cities much more sustainable. So we don't have to wait for federal action, although it'd be great if we had it, but what's interesting is that the local governments and the states are already moving ahead, and, and we're, we're almost there, believe it or not, um, more so than I thought we were five years ago. So this is one of the interesting things with, with transportation planning, and you know, if any of you guys are interested in doing a master's in urban planning, this will be discussed infinitum. You don't need to take it in too deeply right now. But basically what we have on the left-hand side is a typical pyramid of conventional transportation planning. Our focus, like our food, FDA food pyramid, there's too much focus on cars. Like with the FDA pyramid, there's too much focus on carbs. So there's too many cars and too many carbs, not enough carpooling, and very little on transit walking and bicycling. So on the sustainable transportation planning pyramid, just to switch it, to become more sustainable, you have to do most of your trips by walking and bicycling, some of your trips by transit and ride sharing, and special trips by car sharing, you know, ambulance, taxi, that sort of stuff. Now, that's really difficult to get there because imagine having to walk and bicycle everywhere for most of your trips. It's really difficult because of the way the cities are set up. But if you want to be sustainable, that's where you need to go. That's kind of like the easy thing. My job's really easy because I say, this is what we need to do. Um, the hard part is how do you do it? You know, that's, that's the really hard part. So we're trying to figure that out. Thanks slide. So we've looked at what are the different types of modes of transportation available to us. And we've looked at how each one has uh, what we call a, a GHG emission factor. It's greenhouse gas emission factor. So obviously walking has the least greenhouse gas emissions per mile because you're not really emitting anything unless you eat a lot of beans or something like that. You know? <laughs> so you should be okay. Bicycling, believe it or not, you can't tell, but bicycling is a little bit less than walking. Bicycling is the most efficient form of transportation. You actually use less calories bicycling the same distance had you been walking it. Really interesting thing that I figured out a, lot of, a little while ago. Especially if you're going downhill, you don't burn any calories at all. Um, but it makes it up for it. uphill or downhill, you end up with overall more. Um, trains have obviously are the more efficient motorized form. Buses a little bit, uh, a little bit more greenhouse gas emissions. But a single passenger automobile, look at that, all the way to the right. So that has the most greenhouse gas emissions per mile. Right now, the average car burns one pound of CO2 per mile driven. 10 miles you drive, 10 pounds of CO2. You drive 12,000 miles a year, 12,000 pounds of CO2. That's the equivalent. If you drive a Prius, it's half that. If you drive a Ford Extinction or one of those escalated things, <laughs> it's almost double that. So I used to say that all the time when it first came out. It was a Ford Excursion. It's called the Ford Extinction, but you know, that's just me. Um, and then uh, what's also funny about this, though, is that um, a lot of people out there are saying, you know, I drive a Prius, you know, I shop at Whole Foods, I recycle, I'm green, right? 
but they're driving 25,000 miles a year, you know, so versus the person who lives next door, so be very careful when you judge her, because I've learned this the hard way. There was a person who used to go to UCLA who had an Escalade, and he lived in, um, he lived in Bel Air, and, which you would if you had an Escalade, right? Uh, he lived in Bel Air, and his commute was about four and a half miles each, each way. But he averaged about 2,000 miles a year. There was another person in the same class that lived in Northridge, and she had a Prius. And she had to go, what, 15 miles each way or 30 miles each way? She actually has a higher greenhouse gas emissions footprint than the guy who has the Escalade in, that, works, that lives in Bel Air. So always be careful when you're judging people and saying, you know, wh who's doing what, because it's your total footprint that matters rather than what you're doing and what you have that's with you. So, yeah, that kind of woke me up one day. I was kind of like, oh, okay, I have to think about that. So uh, what's interesting to know about this map, this um, scheme, is that it shows that 40% of all U.S. trips, in a sense, as everybody fills this information out, but 40% of all U.S. trips are under two miles. And 61% of all trips in the country are under five miles. That's very bikeable. I mean, that two miles or five miles is a very bikeable distance. Why aren't we bicycling everywhere? That's the big question we always ask. Why aren't people bicycling everywhere? Well, in a, in a recent survey done with the Air Resources Board, 17 to 20% of adults surveyed said they would bike to work sometimes if it was safer. It's just too dangerous. You know, the, the policies, the land use policies in the past have prioritized driving over walking and bicycling or, or taking transit. So it's very difficult for people to feel like they're going to come out and ride their bike in this suit, get all sweaty, and figure out how to get to the end point. You know, Dorothy was sharing one of her first experiences crossing Wilshire Boulevard. It was really scary. You know, uh, there's more scary boulevards than that, don't worry. Uh, then Wilshire, Wilshire Santa Monica is one of the bad ones, but try some out there that are like in Orange County where there's like eight lanes and eight lanes and making a right hand turn. That's pretty scary. Um, next slide. So this is one of these um, cycles of automobile dependency. So what creates that difficult condition to ride your bike? So we basically start off with these land use patterns that are focused on making the car easier to get around with. We focus on planning practices that are focusing on the car, you know, drive-throughs, parking at the front, excessive car parking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We focus on, we, when we do that, we reduce the uh, non-automobile travel options, so we make walking, biking, and, and transit a lot more difficult because there's less space for them, there's less actual area for them. We focus on suburbanization, and that, that degrades the urban areas because it focuses all the resources out in the, the boonies, and the people are commuting in with their cars and basically degrading the, the urban areas because there's too, much, there's too much going on in the urban areas. They don't have enough tax base to, to accommodate the growth. And then we have this generous parking supply option. So this basically keeps creating this cycle of why you have to drive everywhere all the time. And we just have to break that cycle. Next slide. So this is one of those, another schematics that will burn you out. So don't worry, don't try and understand it right now. But what we've done is we've looked at, um, okay, climate change is really big, and we know that local land use practices and, and transportation funding policies are affecting global climate change. So what are the, who are the key players? So a lot of your public, um, if you've done any public policy classes or any of these um, advocacy um, uh, projects, you have to find out who the key players are. Who, who is the audience, number one, and who are the key players? So who is, who's involved, who's doing what, whose responsibility is what, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, like what makes the world go around type of thing. So we looked at, okay, if we're going to look at urban sustainability strategies that have to focus on the environment, the economy, and social equity, they have to come out with sustainability policies. Sustainability policies would be basically broken down to two major categories, energy and resource conservation, so be cleaner and green on the left-hand side, and demand management, reduce your consumption and reduce your, your use of, of, of resources. So on the left-hand side, if you, if you drill that down, like we did that drill diagram before, we drilled that, that down further and so on the left-hand side is energy efficiency, you know, cleaner cars, better um, water recycling efficiency, renewable materials, greener operations, all that sort of stuff. On the sustainable energy side, we look at the fuel technology, so lower, fuel, lower carbon fuels, um, energy pricing so that we're not consuming more than we need to, um, and renewable fuels and growing renewable power and all that sort of stuff. That's, that's the energy and resource conservation. And the benefit of that at the end is you get life cycle cost savings. So the, the savings are, are accrued because your, your materials are more resourceful, you're using less, you have lower overheads, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. On the right-hand side is the, 
the, demand, the managing of the demand. So looking at things like congestion pricing, high occupancy toll lanes, area road pricing, so like they do in London when you drive into the city. In London you have to pay a fee to go there during the congested times. Using intelligent transportation system management, which is just a fancy way of saying, just using computers. Basically, your car telling you where the most congested route is, how to avoid it. On your cell phone, you can get the next train, the next bus, um, you know, all the things that you have on GPS, all that sort of stuff. Um, what that also does is it provides new stable revenues. So the gas taxes are kind of fluctuating all the time but this would provide a direct user, user benefit. If you use it, you pay for it. You don't use it, you don't have to pay for it. That's one of the, the things with the, the pricing mechanism. Then there's parking pricing as well, so you're making sure that you, you pay to park the, the appropriate price rather than having some lots that are free, some lots that are paid, and everyone's circling around Westwood trying to find the cheapest spot because it's out there, maybe it's out there. And we realize that it's not, and all that circling is causing congestion. You might as well just pay the five bucks and go and don't worry about it. You know? If you knew that there was, if there was digital signs that were saying everywhere's a dollar an hour, you say, okay, I'm going to pay it or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out of here. Um, on the right-hand side is smart growth. So looking at the streets, pedestrian, bike, and transit-oriented green streets, and also pedestrian, bike, and transit-oriented mixed-use neighborhoods so that the walking, bicycle, and transit is much more easily done. And what I mean by mixed-use development is that Retails on the ground floor where the pedestrians are to wait for transit and the bicycle storage is there and above it is housing or offices or that sort of stuff. Rather than having housing here, um, offices there and the shopping mall on the other side of the freeway. How many people have seen these developments where you live in a cul-de-sac and if you get up on your balcony or you get up on the roof of your house, you can see the shopping mall like literally a block away, but you have to go outside of the cul-de-sac all the way around, cross the freeway and go on the other side to get to the mall. You know, these are very, I mean, you just have to go to anywhere that's 25 miles out of downtown LA and there's cul-de-sac type developments. Some of you grew up in them probably. Um, you can see that if only you could break through that wall, you could just walk across the street, but you can't, you've got to go all the way around. And that's just one of those things where we just weren't thinking about walking, bicycling, transit back then because cars and gas was really cheap. That's frankly what it is. Now when you do all of these things really well and they all talk to each other perfectly, so basically a carbon footprint is, like so these are my feet, that's my carbon footprint, right? But if you look, that's basically what, what I use, my operations. This is to run my buses. But the funding decisions that come through the state and federal government, the way that I spend that money in how I buy things, what else I do, and I fund other agencies and what they do, do you see the light, there's a shadow around me? That shadow is not my personal responsibility, but it's the result of my actions. So the carbon shadow is almost more important than your carbon footprint. Um, and that's where you have a lot of the personal decisions that we come into it later. So let's just scroll through this. These are the actions that we've looked at. Um, like just to go, that was a very good question that you asked. So we looked at what's it going to be to the region if we go from CNG to complete zero emissions? It's going to be very little. Its effect on regional greenhouse gas emissions not that much, because we're less than 1% of the region's emissions, so it's not, not going to do much for us, and it's going to be very expensive. If we green our transportation programming, that kind of helps us better, you know, focusing on bikes, walking, and transit. If we um, make sure that every car in LA County is greener, more energy efficient, that, does, that helps us a long way there as well. Making sure that our streets and our developments grow smarter, that helps us along as well. Demand management, if we just price everything, if you have to pay to, to drive around this whole region, that almost gets us a long way. But we've realized none of them by themselves are going to work. We have to do all of them. And so incorporating all the above is where we're going to need to be direct, uh, headed in the next, next few years. Next slide. So what are the benefits of transit? Well, nationwide transit reduced about 7 million metric tons of CO2 in 2005. This is the biggest single action a household can take. If you switch from one solo commuter, so if you have, a two, if you have two, transit, two, two solo commuters in a household, which most people do, right? If one person from that switches to taking transit a few times a week, you can save 20 pounds per day on reduced CO2 emissions or 4,800 pounds per year. That's the single largest action a household can take to reduce their carbon footprint and to really impact global warming, more so than anything else you can think of. It's, it's amazing. This is the largest single uh, action you can take. Transit reduces energy consumption dependence. Um, in the US, 
Transit saves about one month of imported Saudi oil. So over 850 million gallons a year or 45 million barrels of oil is saved just by taking transit. So it also has an energy, uh, energy independence factor as well. Next slide. So this is basically the benefits of transit. 200 people can commute in about 177 cars. The, the load factor for a car is about 1.1 uh, in LA County. So this is four blocks. Uh, 200 people can commute in 177 cars or one light rail vehicle. So all that road space was in for 200 people, or you can put them on a two-car light rail vehicle. Or they can fit in three 40-foot buses. So three of those buses down Wilshire Boulevard are carrying about 200 people, sometimes 300 people. Um, or they can buy, commute on bikes. So that's one lane that's needed. And you can see on the right there's a bike lane there. So it really goes to show you that human beings have a very small footprint. You know, no matter how big you think we are as, as, as a nation, we're, we're still pretty small. You know, this, is, this is our footprint. We don't need those 4,000 pounds of steel around us to move us from point A to point B all the time. So what are the other options that we can do? And it, and it really helps us out with our um, use of road space. So reduce the cost for families. Um, Average household costs right now are about 51% of their income. It's becoming very expensive to move around in cities in America. It's, it's becoming more and more expensive. And some um, households have freaked down from surveys that when they switch to transit, not completely getting rid of the car, but switching to transit, they're saving about $10,000 a year per household. So it really does make a huge difference. I mean, you look at it from, from a UCLA perspective. If you have to drive to UCLA, you have to pay, is it $8 a day now for car parking? Nine. Should be 50, but let's say it's nine, right? You have to pay $9 to get your parking permit if you can get it. You have to operate and maintain a car that on average is going to cost you at least $300 a month or $500 a month unless you've got one that's fully paid off. You know, that money could be going to books, to classes that you really, to, uh, you know, extra quick activities that would really enrich your, your schooling rather than wasting all that on a car. It just doesn't seem to make sense from an from a, from a educational perspective either. And what's interesting, and I've always criticized you slightly about this, but one car parking space uh, with the associated space that's needed to park it, to take it up a ramp and all sort of stuff, is the size of a dorm room. So why do we have all this car parking space when we could have dorm rooms and all students could be living on campus and walking around campus rather than having to drive to campus? And they cost about the same per space, which is kind of like, Anyway, so next slide. So these are things you always think about. Yes? Um, how do you feel like the expense of transit will have an effect like, on the prices of real estate? Uh, it's actually already having a very big impact right now. So um, the question was how does, it affect, how does transit affect the price of real estate? The closer now you live to a subway stop at a metro subway stop, the more expensive the, the, the cost of land is the more expensive the housing or retail is, and the higher the rents are. Just look at any Craigslist ad. If they're near Hollywood and Vine or Hollywood and, uh, uh, Hollywood and um, Highland, that's the first thing they say, within walking blocks of the metro stop, and it's usually you know, a little bit more than something that's about 10 blocks away. So it does, does make an effect with real estate prices. Yeah, it, no, it actually ends up being, uh, it, overall, you end up, it ends up costing you less, less to live, yeah. But that's a, that's a very good question. See, I like that for thinking, it's great, it's really cool. So all of this stuff is coming from like the outside, but the state has actually just released its um, global warming um, solutions plan. It's the climate change, it's the proposed scoping plan for climate change. It's basically the state government saying, okay, all these things are really important, and they've developed a plan to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by down to 1990 levels by 2020. Uh, right now, the average um, Californian man, woman, and child is responsible for 14 tons of CO2 per year. Most of you, I'm hoping, is way below that, but that's the average when you add up all of the emissions in the state and you divide it by the 38 million people in the state, it's about 14 uh, tons per person. Um, our goal in 2020 is to reduce that down to 10 tons per person factoring in that we're going to have about 43 million people by 2020. So everybody knows that California is the largest state with the most population, 38 million people today, 50 million by 2040. We're, going to be, we're basically at Spain's population. We're heading towards France really quickly. So just to give it a perspective of where the state is. Um, the plan also recognizes the governor's executive order to reduce the carbon footprint to about two tons per person by 2050. So all this stuff that I was talking about, these actions that we're going to take, 
that's like the low-hanging fruit. We're going to have to do some massive changes between 2030 and 2050, which is pretty much all in our lifetime. If you want more information, go to arb.co.gov. I'll, I'll give you that information further. There's two other polls that have happened right now that are helping make Dorothy's job a little bit easier. Uh, one is SB 375. So a lot of this is in state legislation. This just got up signed by the governor. It requires transportation land use decisions now to be integrated together to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So a lot of that diagram stuff is now um, going to be required. And then AB 1358 is the complete streets bill that requires transportation planning agencies to adopt the complete streets principles, which is accommodating the needs of pedestrians, bicyclists, and transit riders in addition to motorists in all of their decisions. So it's going to, so the government is basically, the state government has figured out that this is the document, these are the actions, and the legislature, legislature has basically passed all these different laws now that are going to try and, try and get to those, those bubbles that we had shown before, the, the independent variables. Next slide. So what's Metro doing? Well, Metro is looking at a comprehensive sustainability implementation plan, greener fuels. We have the largest um, renewable power source um, of any transit agency in the country. Right now, we have 1.9 megawatts, 1.85, sorry, megawatts of solar power. We've done an assessment that based on all the facilities that we own, we could, we could probably get up to 30 megawatts of solar power. So we're already the largest in the, in the nation, and we're going to try and just keep moving forward on that. Um, it's a great sight to see. This is in the valley, in, uh, in um, I think it's just north of Van Nuys. And looking out towards the mountains, you just see all these, like, rays of, all these arrays of solar panels. It's pretty cool. And we're focusing on doing a lot more transit corridors so that people can get away from having to commute by freeway. That's the gold line over a bridge looking at the freeway. On the right, we're looking at multimodal corridors. So that's the orange line in the valley where we have a walkway, a bikeway, and a transit way. In addition to that, we added about 20,000 trees, so we try to reduce the, um, the impact of that corridor. And what's interesting is that the orange line parallels the 101 freeway. One third of the new riders on the, on the orange line were former commuters on the 101, so it's actually helped the 101 as well. So we're looking at this whole multimodal um, coordination. And then we have a lot of these campaigns where we're trying to educate the public about making the right decisions to fight global warming, but we're realizing we can't do it by ourselves, so that's why we're starting to collaborate with all these other agencies around the, the, the county, public sector, private sector, UCLA, all these different organizations to do their part in, in sending out the message. So keep scrolling, just keep going. So this is how we're doing it from an operations side. So we're looking at air quality and climate change, energy efficiency, and program support. These are the different things that we're looking at so that we can get to these sustainability policies that we're talking about. And we'll look about We'll be monitoring it every year. So what have we done and what do we need to do so we, we keep ourselves on track? Okay. This is just a really good example of how the cars in California have become so clean that they're no longer... Um, any cleaner cars aren't going to do much for air quality. But the cars burn a lot of fuel, which has a high carbon content. And so this graph just shows you that Reducing a vehicle trip mile is six times more likely to impact climate change than regional air pollution. So reducing car travel is a climate change action right now rather than an air pollution action because the cars, some new cars right now, what's up, what comes out of the tailpipe is cleaner than what comes in through the radiator. So, because the ambient pollution is worse than what's coming out of the car. Um, what BMW, Toyota Camry, and I think the, one of the VWs has basically a partial zero emissions right now. So the, the cars are getting better and better, but there's still too many cars and they're still using gasoline, which is a climate change issue. Keep scrolling. Just scroll through this one. It's just how you do your footprint. Um, uh, let's keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Just go to the end, because we're running out of time. Just keep going. These are the, the Wilshire BRT lines, the, the Metro Rapid lines that are all running through the city. Uh, this is the difference of how when you have a bus stuck in congestion, and then when you dedicate a lane, look at the difference. The bus can just basically run right through. And slowing down a Metro bus um, in our bus system by one mile an hour costs the agency $81 million more a year. So it really is a huge issue that we have priority for transit on these major boulevards. Um, and it's very difficult to get priority of transit lanes from cities because that lane is my lane. 
as a driver. You can't take my lane away from me. And that lane is a parking lane for a merchant who lives on Wilshire Boulevard and says, that's my car parking spot. Without that one parking spot, I'm going to go to business. You know, so you've got to, how do you balance all those needs? And when do you make the decision that, I'm sorry, but the priority is for, for transit? So there's a, that, that's, that's a good example of, of how it works. Just skip through that. This is just GIS stuff, how we do analysis of corridors. This is the, the bike transit hub network plan that we developed where we looked at all of the stations and how accessing the station is a real issue. And, and Dorothy, um, through the LACBC, is working on two of these. Two of them, is it? Six. six. Working on six of, these, six of these to get better access to the transit hub so that people don't have to drive to transit. Um, and this is an example of Burbank, how we looked at all the different existing facilities and how we can improve them. Keep going. And then we're doing a, a looking at uh, LEED, which is, anybody, everyone's familiar with LEED? Okay, so LEED is the, lab, the, LEED is the leader in energy efficient design. It's basically a rating system to make sure that buildings become greener so they have like silver, gold, platinum, etc. Well, now they've realized that that wasn't enough and they're working with urban planners to develop LEED neighborhood development, so LEED for neighborhoods. And we've already started looking at where the potential areas that could qualify for LEED for late neighborhood development. And then most along that chain that runs from downtown to Santa Monica that has most of the transit. So the transit is the the, one of the integral keys to these neighborhood for development. Go okay, next slide. Uh, next slide. Don't worry about that. That's fine. So this is what I wanted to put um, at the end, which is what can you do about all this? It's very overwhelming. And um, there's so much going on. And you hear all this stuff that's going on about you know, what, I can, what can I do and you know, all these different things. And frankly, 10 years of my research has broken it down to three things that you, that you can do. And this is the easiest thing that you can do. And, and really, there really is no argument about this because I, I've tried it every single way. And I've tried all these different things. And frankly, it comes down to how you get around, how you live, and, how you, and what you eat. That is the three largest, single most things that affect your personal CO2 emissions budget. So if we all have a budget of 14 tons, okay, and we've got to go to 10 tons, and that means we have to reduce it by what's from 14 to 10, math whizzes. What's the percentage? Like 20%? Yeah. What's the percentage? So it's only like 25%, right? So we need to go down to 10 tons. How do we do that? Well, there's the good way, the better way, and the best way. And I tell you, the good way is going to get you down to 10 tons. The better way is going to get you down to about 7 tons. And the best way is going to get you down to 2 tons. That 2050 goal that we need to all get to, it's going to create some changes in your lifestyle. So under the categories of transportation, housing, and diet, the, best, the good way for transportation is just to drive less. If you have a car and you've got to get around by car because transit's not available right now, the best option is just try and drive less. Chain your trips. Try and, try and drive as, as little as you can. Don't go over 55. Don't be a pedal hog, you know, and keep your tires inflated. Take all the, the junk out of the trunk, you know, all that sort of stuff. And um, get all that out of there so that you can, you, the car can be as, as, as light as possible. And then if you can, get a car with higher miles per gallon. Like we said, that Ver, you know, Escalade versus Prius depends how much you're driving. So drive less is the key and get a higher miles per gallon. The better option is to try and take transit at least two or three times a week, replace a lot of the car trips with transit, and then do some walking and some bicycling. The best option is to focus solely on walking, biking, and transit. Get rid of the car. Rent cars if you need them for special trips. You want to go camping, you want to go and see your friends in other parts of the, the region, fine. But you don't need to own a car. So you know, rent it when you need to use car sharing or whatever it is, but walk, bike, and transit. In housing, one of the biggest sources of, of, of electricity consumption in our houses is all the freaking things we have in there. We just don't turn them off anymore because they all stay on standby, right? So unplug everything. That's the best thing you can do to reduce your, your, your electricity um, consumption. If you can, there's new plugs you can buy that's an auto shut off, and they shut off everything straight away. So go to Best Buy and check that out. There's ones where you, the new apples that are going to be coming out in the next generation will automatically shut off. If they don't see activity for more than half an hour, they'll just shut down. So appliances are starting to, to do some intelligent things. And then insulate. You know, try and make sure that those gaps in your house are all sealed off and, and all sort of stuff. The better option is to green the place. Put solar panels on the roof, heavy insulation, 
you know, all this stuff, live, live, live a little bit frugally and try not to, to consume as much stuff. The best option is to live in a green mixed-use development. You know, they're going to be hard because they take a long time to build, but there's a lot of them out there. You can just live in a more transit-oriented neighborhood. You're already there. And live in a smaller place. Smaller things take less heat to, to, and cooling, so the smaller, the better. On the diet, this is the biggest controversial thing that I've had to do with for like five years now because I've been testing all these different things. And there's a lot of research out there that has been really well done. On the diet, if you eat red meat even twice a week, that is the equivalent of taking four hour long showers 10 times a week. That's how much water is used for, to make red meat. You could actually eat a bucket of grains every day and still not get to the amount of grains that have been consumed by the animals to, to eat the red meat. And the meat has all these extra issues. There's petroleum, pesticides, transport, blah, 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 blah. The list goes on and on and on. It really is the, the most carbon intensive form of protein. We're looking at protein sources now, not to completely avoid protein. Obviously, if you get your meat more locally, that's much better. If you eat less meat, so you cut it down to like one time a week or, two, or twice a week or three times a week, then you're obviously doing better than, than um, the person who eats it four times a day. Um, a lot of people do. They'll have meat for breakfast, you know, bacon and egg McMuffin, and then you'll have your hamburger for lunch at the, at the Ackerman Union, and then at night time you go out for some burritos. You've had red meat, red meat, red meat all the way through, right? Um, so it's very easy to do, and so you don't think about it, but those actions are the equivalent of driving an Escalade all the way around the town all day long. So it's, it's, a real, it's, it's a real issue. Local foods are better because there's less transport costs, so that's a, that's a, that's a good option. Whether it's organic or not is irrelevant. It's, it's local, it's more important. Um, organic jet-flown peaches from Chile don't have any benefit than the local, local peaches grown up in the valley that may have pesticides, may not have pesticides. That's a health issue. It's not a carbon intensity issue. You know, those Whole Foods peaches from Chile flew on a jet, dude, to get here. I mean, come on, that's pretty crazy. Do you need to eat peaches in January? I'm not sure. Let's wait in July when you're in season. Um, <laughs> the better option is to go local vegetarian and to um, some poultry. Contrary to popular opinion, a true lacto-ovo vegetarian diet that is all based on milk and eggs has a high carbon footprint than a mixed vegetable and poultry diet. Hate to admit it, I've been fighting it for five years, but all the data shows that it's actually better to eat a little bit of chicken and mostly vegetables and grains than just having dairy and being lacto-vegetarian. Why? Because the dairy, the dairy industry and the, um, the, the dairy industry itself is one of the most carbon-intensive forms of production. They are heated, the, the cows are literally heated all day long in sheds. They are uh, fed all of these uh, different types of hormones and God knows what else they're fed, unless you're getting organic ones. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on, but it's the transport of the dairy, the refrigeration, the, the constant um, intensity of, of, of inputs that go into keeping dairy very fresh. It's actually a high carbon footprint. Trust me, I've been fighting for five years. All the data shows the opposite. So anyway, so moving on. Obviously, the, the best option is to be local vegan. And when I mean local, it's like growing at home and trying to get stuff locally. Um, a vegan diet that the food's grown, some of the food's grown from home, but most of it's sourced locally, is the lowest carbon footprint that you can have. And you meet all your protein, calcium, and, and thiamine needs. There's no, all that stuff from the 80s where, oh, where are you gonna get your protein from? It's all available. The key is, though, do you have to do all those three things on the right-hand column? Not right now, so we have some time. So what I always tell people is, don't jump from eating bacon egg McMuffins, burritos, and everything else to, I'm only gonna eat raw food, you know? <laughs> you, you can't do that. You're gonna be like, oh, you're gonna be like, oh my God, you know? I've tried it, tried it, you know? I've tried it. I went from eating, I didn't eat a lot of meat, but I used to eat a lot of fish and stuff, and I went vegan and, passed out a few times and thought, oh, I'll go do some homework, right? <laughs> so what we talk about is we talk about, like, we talk about you know, easing into it, ease into it. So if you eat meat 10 times a week, go to eight times a week for a couple of months. Go to four times a week in a couple of months. Go to two times a week. That you'll start noticing the difference when you go to two times a week. And then start breaking it down. Try and buy food that's locally. Go to your farmer's market, um, all that sort of stuff. 
Unplug things first. Don't throw the appliance out and say, I'm not having appliances anymore. I'm going to live like a monk in a little room. You can't do that. Because we live in a we live in this we live in this military military industrial complex system. It's all globalized. Everything you do has a is hurting somebody else somewhere else in an undeveloped world. That's just how it is. Even if you buy a crack, a BlackBerry, your laptop, your iPhone, dude, it's designed in California. Well, it's made by somebody in 17 different countries who are getting cancer from making those products. So whatever you do has a negative impact. So let's try and be conscious of what we're doing. So that you can say, today, I can't take transit because it's not available, it sucks, or it's too slow, so I'm going to drive. But I'm going to try and drive under 55, you know. Or today, I'm confronted with this dilemma. Do I have the $3.50 Big Mac fries and Coke? Or do I have the $10 organic, local, vegan, high-protein salad? Do I have $10? You know, if I have $3.50, I'm going to eat because I'm hungry, you know. But you're consciously making a decision every day. Maybe tomorrow you'll make the, the different decision. On the, on the, um, the, the housing, you know, um, do you have to have the... Guys, why do we have the tap on when we're shaving? Why do we do that? Turn the tap off. You know, when you just shake the razor, do it again, shake it again, do it again. You don't need to have it on. Brushing your teeth. Who, lets the, who just cannot stop the tap when they're brushing their teeth? Why is the tap on? We don't need the tap on. Turn it off. You know, actually, you don't even need to tap on to, to wet the toothbrush. Your mouth salivates already. So it's little things like that that make such a huge difference collectively. And because there's no magic bullet, everyone says, oh, it's too hard. But these little things, trust me, they all add up. And if you, if you can get to the good, the good actions, you're already there because you've already got your mindset into the better. And then all of a sudden, you'll think, you know, I can do the better. I can go into the best. And all of a sudden, you look back and think, how did I get from here to there? Whereas when you're over here, to get there is so far away. So at the start, we had the A, where the unsustainable cities are, and the Zs, the sustainable cities. Sustainable cities can only happen if we're sustainable as individuals. So we've got to like ease into it slowly, but surely. Um, you know, I always, when I show this to people, they always, they always say, you know, are you sure? You know, what if you're wrong? I'm like, what if I am wrong? You know? But all the research shows, <laughs> what if I am wrong? But I mean, if you think about it, if all the research shows that driving very large, high, high gas guzzling vehicles, living in large houses, constantly heating and cooling them, and consuming infinitum, and then constantly eating food that's you know, high in carbon emissions, I mean, it doesn't take a rocket science to realize that if you cut those down, you're going to cut down your emissions. So it isn't rocket science, guys. And unfortunately, it's overlapped here. But the bottom line is, is just reduce your consumption. Stop mindlessly consuming. You know, I know it's really hard to go from Ackerman Union down to Wilshire Boulevard and not want to buy something along the way. But, and right now, because you guys are on a limited budget, it's a little easier to say, I can't afford it. You know? But trust me, when you start working, it gets really hard not to buy stuff. Even buying green stuff, you know, it's like you're still consuming. So it's just this whole thing of, can we calm down and not have to constantly buy stuff? And based on that, you guys are set. So thanks for coming. <laughs>
it's a little institute within Cal Poly and they focus on environmental um, efficiency and that sort of stuff. And that's where I learned most of this stuff that was always in my head, but I actually got to see how it was all working. And it really piqued my interest. And then I was, um, I came back to Australia, finished my degree, and then came back to the US um, to work for the city of Malibu. And um, when I was working with the city of Malibu, we were looking at all these um, coastal resource issues. And there was a lot of um, heavy metal pollution in the Malibu Lagoon. And, and there was like all these different uh, metals in there. And I was just like really curious with the city biologist saying, you know, why is all this heavy metal in here? Where is it coming from? And she sat me down one day and basically went through the whole process of these heavy metals are traced upstream to the 101 freeway where the constant brake grinding that cars do collects on the sides of the freeways. And when we have those heavy rains, it washes all that aluminum and alloy down the creeks into the lagoon and it pollutes all of the lagoon. And I just got this like, you know, really like, oh my God, it's terrible. And you know, I was a coastal resource planner. I was like, this is outrageous. And then I, I said to her, what do you think I should do? And she said, well, frankly, we need to stop the amount of cars and the congestion because that's what's causing the brake grinding and polluting the oceans. And I just had this like, you know, I was like you know, 23 or 22 and I just had this like aha moment where I just was like, what am I doing here working for the city of Malibu? I need to go work for the MTA. I need to like reduce the amount of the, the congestion and reduce the amount of cars on the road and focus on getting people alternatives because the end goal is to help the water, right? To help the oceans because I, I love the oceans. Um, so I do, I love them. I love you. I'm from Australia. I grew up in the oceans. You know, that's just how it is. Um, and so that was the connection of the MTA. So I applied for the MTA and I've been there for eight years now. Um, they are a really amazing organization, I have to say, for personal development. Um, they paid for me to come to UCLA to do my master's. Um, and they allowed me to do the, the program full time. Um, they've been nothing but supportive for all of the things that I want to do. The interesting thing about the agency is that it's so large that you as a, if you're interested in transportation planning, if you're interested in building infrastructure, if you're interested in green uh, energy, any of those things, there's so many opportunities there at the agency because it's so large that you can pretty much do anything that you like or any of the new stuff. Being so large as well, it kind of sometimes, for the public, loses focus and, and doesn't do the best that it could in, in certain things. So it's this constant evolution of, of thinking. And I've always liked the concept of the, of the agency in that it's very large and broad. It's more than a transit agency. It's a transportation authority. And they really do look at the macro big picture from you know, 50,000 feet level all the way down to the intersection. And they're really, really trying to figure it out. And I've just always, that's been my calling. I don't think it's everybody's calling. But um, if you're interested in doing any of those reducing transportation impacts, reducing the housing impacts, or reducing the diet impacts, and you're interested in sustainability, they're your three career corridor paths you need to go on. And if you can do all three, all the power to you. I haven't figured out how to do that yet, but um, maybe we'll sell green local vegan food on the bus. I'm not sure how we're going to reduce the whole thing. Um, but that's, they're basically the three, the three key areas that I would recommend that we're going to need a lot of help on in the next 10 years um, for your career path. So it's, I have to say, I'm a real optimist. I think it's going to be an exciting next 10 years. It's going to be really scary for the first couple of years when we're going to be hearing a lot more media imagery about how bad things are. But all of those things are going to create an opportunity for change and to be different. And we really have a, an amazing opportunity. If you guys are graduating in the next, three or, next two or three or four years, I mean, the amount of green-focused jobs is literally doubling every couple of months. So you're going to, that's basically the, the key areas. I think this is going to be the generation of healers that are going to heal, trying to heal the planet. Um, heal the society as well. So the next 30 years, that's, that's basically what we're going to be focusing on is how do we heal um, what, we've, what we've done for the last two centuries. Yeah. Yeah, so um, what I'll do is I'll send them, send them to, to Lucina because I've got a long last name and you probably won't be able to figure out how to spell it. Um, it's, um, I would go to... Um, there's a few resources. Go to the Air Resources Board, so www.arb.ca.gov. Anything with the California government is going to give you some great resources. Um, and then if you go to uh, metro.net forward slash sustainability, 
we have a whole uh, section on sustainability. And then I would also recommend um, that, you, that you actually just Google uh, sustainability Los Angeles and all of these links come up which are really good resources uh, for you to look at as well. So, um, yeah. We can also put the PowerPoint online if you yeah. want to share that. Yeah, absolutely. I'll PDF it and put online. Um, and you can always contact me. I have resources. Yes? Um, I could not agree with you more that it's all about reducing consumption. Uh -huh. And I'm still amazed at the brilliance of reduce, then reuse, then recycle. Uh -huh. But I feel that on... And rebel. Um, the fourth one's rebel. And rebel. Okay, yeah. okay. So if it has to come to that. Um, but I almost feel that right now we're even having difficulty just convincing people to recycle or to think about waiting an extra second instead of tossing in a trash can and going to a recycle bin. So right. I guess I'm just wondering with your experience, you know, what is the most convincing argument to convince people to reduce, let alone recycle? Because I feel that a lot of the times it has to come through, you know, sitting in a classroom and, and being educated on exactly what's happening in order for it to click in people's minds. Yeah. And I don't know if it, if there is a quick solution, but I'm constantly trying to look for that because I feel that it is this kind of dire situation that needs to be addressed. And if we can't even get people to you know, think about why recycling makes sense, then how are you going to convince someone to change their lifestyle mm -hmm. and start reducing individual habits? Right. So I mean, you've, you've hit it right in the head. It's this whole thing of, I care about the situation, but I don't want to change anything I'm doing because it's too hard. Right? So I don't want to not have to have that triple milk or chocolate latte from Starbucks. I don't, want, I don't want to give that up. But it's actually easier than that. It's just education. The more we educate, the better, the better we are. And the more we can convince media and marketing to thread these, these messages through their, their marketing campaigns. On the recycling front, um, that was actually a, a, a policy that's been changed now. We were really forcing people to recycle. And it was getting all mixed up and contaminated. We couldn't basically get that guarantee of, of recycling. By the way, guys, California has the highest recycling rate in the country. And Los Angeles City, and LA City has the highest recycling rate in California. So we're already at 58%. They're going to try and go to 70%. Uh, what you're going to start seeing more and more is the recycling bins are going to start going away. And that everything's going to start getting recycled from the trash cans. They've already started that, and a lot of agents have already started that. So it's called Murphing. It's the mixed-use recycling facilities. And they basically just bring everything in now, and they physically separate it all out, because it's just the individual recycling thing is, hasn't been working very well. But it's just education and outreach, just much more outreach and more examples. And at the end of the day, things are going to kind of become more expensive, so people are going to have to make the decisions anyway. We have yeah. to, uh, one more question. Uh -huh. um, considering most of us, at least in this room and probably at UCLA, are from Cal the state of California, uh -huh. uh, we, a lot of us consider traveling long distance to get home for holidays. And so airplanes come into the picture. Mm -hmm. And the main rationale I tell myself is planes are going to fly throughout the day from Los Angeles to San Francisco, whether I'm on it or not. Uh -huh. What would your advice be for us when we're considering this? You're right. That's just, it's, it's a scheduled flight. You know, so the, the thing is, um, are you adding to the, the demand to add more flights? You know, that's the, always the, the trouble I have. And, and for me, I have to travel a lot for work. You know, so my personal carbon footprint is about three and a half to four metric tons of CO2. But because I have to work and travel this place, it goes up to seven. You know, so um, it's just this balancing act of, you know, what, how do you make it work? The key is uh, driving's worse. So driving from here to, to San Francisco is worse than flying. So you're better off flying because that's a more efficient way to move. Um, taking the bus is better, and then if we had a high-speed rail, it would be the best, but we don't have it yet. But, you know, Lucino, I think, is going to take care of that. Um, the, other thing I, the other thing I'd also mention is, um, you know, all of these things have to be put in balance. Your family is really important, so that one trip to see your family is worth probably more than 10 times commuting by car in the city, right? So or how, many, how, many, how, much, how much more worth it is to you? So if you have to have a total budget and out of your 10 metric tons, two metric tons are caused up by seeing family, then cut back on those other areas if you're really worried about it that way. Because family is really important. You have to, create, you have to keep those social connections. Can I, so, I just want to add real quick, I'm going to link to that yeah. question about the airplane. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard anything about mitigating pollution from airplanes as well. Has there been any kind of movement 
Yeah, there is. I mean, airplanes, believe it or not, are 50% more efficient than, than they were 10 years ago. So they're, they're just they're flying that much more. That's the problem. So like cars, they're getting more and more efficient, more environmentally friendly. There's just too many of them, and they're flying all the time. Um, the new A380 that's coming from Sydney to Los Angeles, that runs on half the fuel, has half the emissions, and carries twice as many people as the 747. But they're just going to replace the 747s. So There's going to be just more of them flying. So it's, you know, they're, they're doing the best they can. They've looked at things from biofuels to um, lighter, vi lighter planes. I mean, the, the gas issue really ran home with airplanes because they started charging for that extra bag. You know, I used to fly years ago um, in Europe or in Australia, and you were maximum allowed 20 pounds. That was it. No questions asked. You couldn't even pay for more. And I come to the US and my parents were say, oh, I love traveling to the US. I can bring everything on board and 10 suitcases. No one's going to say anything. And it's so cool. And that's all changed because it's finally affected us here in terms of traveling as well. So the international students know what I'm talking about because it's really strict. But coming to the US, it's like, oh, cool. I can have what I want. So it's just, it's a matter of price. Where the price makes, hits that sweet spot, the efficiencies come in, and then the demand basically gets managed as well, but it's all to do with price. You guys saw when it was $4.50 a gallon in LA, the freeway started clearing up temporarily for one second. Then they, everyone got used to it and got me back, back again. But now the gas prices have come down to about three fifty. The congestion has gone up again. So it really is a price issue. It's coming down now because people are losing their jobs. You know, so the best, the best congestion remedy is global recession. You know, but we don't want to go there. We don't want to go there. So always be careful of what you want. Every action has a reaction, right? So, yeah. Okay, I think we're done. Thanks, guys.